Hey guys, Toby Mathis here, and today we're going to talk about how they keep us poor. When I say how they keep us poor, I don't mean like there's a world conspiracy, but there are folks out there that are willing to take advantage of other people, and there's systems in place that need to have folks that take advantage. All you have to do is look at capitalism, and to the extent that they can, they're going to they're going to get done whatever they need to get done with the least amount of cost, which puts them at a competing interest. So if you're an employee, for example, your employer is going to pay you as much as it takes to get the job done, but they're probably not going to give you a big chunk of the profit and say, hey, you know what? You did such a great job. I'm just going to give you all the profit. No, they're usually they have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders. They're supposed to be giving the profit to them. Now, there are benevolent folks out there that like to share with their staff and everything, but the goal is to pay the least amount to get the work done so that they can maximize profit. That's what capitalism is all about. Once you realize that, then you can say, what other systems are like that? Well, the American system for our tax system, for example, uh, there's an incentive to get you to pay the highest amount in tax. And I'll explain that in a second. How do they keep you poor? They keep you working in an area like if I had two choices, hey, you can make a dollar in A or you can make a dollar in B. If you make a dollar in A, you pay, you get to keep the whole dollar. If you make a dollar in B, you only keep 70 cents and I keep 30. If you're the government, you want people working in B. And unfortunately, that's where most of us go is right over to B. And we're, we're going we're gonna to end up working for that 70 cents on the dollar as opposed to the dollar. Now, the rich people, where do you think they go? Do you think they're going straight to that 70 cents or do you think they're going over to the dollar? So I'll lay this all out for you here in just, just a second. We're going to get into taxation and we're going to use it as a guide. And it's going to explain to us a lot of what we need to do. But first off, 10,000 foot view. How do they keep us poor? Real simple is they screw up our minds. There was statutes back in the day when the horrible chapter in the United States history, right? When we had slavery. But those statutes are actually pretty, pretty glaring. Because what it would say is, even if you're a free person, you cannot teach. It's a crime to teach a non-free person how to read, write, do arithmetic, other than like they would have exceptions, like unless you're working with crops or something stupid like that, right? Absolutely ridiculous. But what it was, was got to keep them dumb. In order to control us, they have to keep us dumb. So like if I, let's just lay this out in its simplest format. Freedom equals education and knowledge. It doesn't mean going to school. It means being a student your whole life. Every successful person I've ever met, people that I would want to be like, the, the mentors that I've had in my life, they were students. They always took it. They were curious. They were always learning new skills. It's kind of like people that go out there and say, I'm going to learn the stock market. Fantastic. I was going to learn real estate, but I decided to focus on one thing. You could do both. And your skill sets play off of each other. So like if you go in and you learn something like music, and you learn philosophy, and you learn mathematics, and then you, you, and you take all those things, they impact what you might be doing for your living. Maybe you're an accountant, maybe you're a computer engineer, whatever the case, all of those activities, all of that learning plays itself pretty well. Like the, the best example I can think of is Steve Jobs, right? Some of you guys have probably heard his story. If you haven't watched some of his speeches. He does a great speech, I think, at Stanford's commencement or graduating class. And he's talking, he's talking about his, when he left college. Before he left college, he, he decided he was going to burn a semester or a quarter or whatever it was. And he took a calligraphy class. Well, here's a guy who ends up engineering some of the greatest technological products ever, life changing, world changing, and fonts came from the fact that he decided to take a detour and learn about calligraphy. In other words, if somebody ever says, you can only do one thing, just focus on that one thing. Tell them, no, I, I can have experiences. I can, I, I can be well-rounded. I can go out and I can learn about things. If you want to get even micro, let's say we're talking about real estate, learn about flipping, learn about wholesaling, learn about tax liens, learn about buy and hold, learn about self-storage, learn about multifamily, learn about commercial. It doesn't mean you have to invest in it all, but you're going to get skills. Learn about the stock market. One of my favorite things about the stock market is because I've, I've spent so much time in real estate and I love cash flow property so much. I said, what can, what can I apply there? Hey, let's do be a stock market landlord because you don't buy a house 
as a rental and leave it vacant. That's bad. So why would you buy a stock and leave it vacant and not make money on that stock? Why would I buy a stock and just go, oh, please go up? Oh, I hope you go up. No, you need to have dividends coming in. You need to do covered calls. We do a company called the wheel strategy where we're doing a cash secured put to even get into the position. You're making money sometimes three different ways, regardless of what the stock's doing. And then if it goes up, that's gravy. Would never have thought about that stuff unless I was involved in real estate because real estate is pretty straightforward. If I buy it and there's an expense of, of, of holding it, I better make more off that property so I'm getting paid. There's an old, old, old saying, it's not my drinking that's got me stinking. It's my stinking thinking that's got me drinking. Right? They mess with your brain and then all these bad things start happening, bad habits coming out. Probably the worst one that I see is they convince us to bypass opportunities to buy assets. And when I say that, I'm going to use Monopoly as an example. Anybody who's played Monopoly a few times, if you've never played it, go play it. And you'll see what I'm talking about. The first few times around the board, you land on something, Baltic Avenue, Connecticut, whatever it is, Park Avenue, buy it. Right? You're buying everything that you can that's going to be an income producing asset. Hey, it's going to make me money. I land on a utility, you land on a railroad, buy it because somebody else might buy it. And then, then you're going to be paying them rent. If you want to win that game, you have to accumulate assets and you have to have other people paying you to use those assets. In real life, somehow they convinced us not to do that. The first thing we do when we graduate from high school is go out there and go get some liabilities. Let's go get ourselves into so much debt we can barely breathe anymore. And then, and then once we get that, we get into a job, let's go buy a, a really expensive house, a big liability and get so much debt that, that if, if we could breathe, now it's choking the rest out of us. And then you got to keep up with the Joneses over there so you get some credit cards too. And they're just slowly choking us out. And we just keep getting more liabilities. You're going around the Monopoly board and you're in every time you're like, hey, I want, I'm only going to buy liabilities. I'm only going to buy, buy it if I have to pay you <laughs> to have it. It doesn't even exist in Monopoly, right? It's ridiculous. But it exists in reality. Here's the deal. They have you convinced that if you go around the Monopoly board and you stay out of jail and you pass go and get your 200 bucks, that somehow that's going to be a victory. I have no assets, but you stayed out of jail. That's a good one. And you're making money every time you pass go, which is silly, right? You'll never win at Monopoly. You'll never live at life or win at life. If you live with that mentality, you have to buy assets. And what they've done is they've disguised liabilities like cars and your big house, your big fancy house, but they've, they've disguised the boats, all these things. And they say they're assets, list them on your net worth. No, that's not an asset. It's a liability. How do I know? Cause it costs me money every month. Assets put money in your pockets. Liabilities take money out of your pockets. That's how you know. But my house is my biggest asset. It's not an asset. You might have a living expense. I would suggest that you use 25% of your take-home pay and say, that's my living expense. And then decide you know, and watch how they, how they manipulate that when you're getting a mortgage. Oh, you can afford more house. Yeah, you can choke yourself out a little bit slower. Like, hey, we're going to get you some more debt so you can suffer more. Right. So the first thing is understand that if you're going to win in life, you got to buy assets. And why is that? Because there's only so much time. There's only so much time for you to work. And if you're trading your time for money, eventually you're going to run out of time or you're going to get tired. I think Warren Buffett used to say, if you don't figure out how to make money while you're sleeping, you're going to work till you die. And this is the principle. You got to buy assets so you're making money while you're sleeping. If all you're doing is trading time for money, you're in that, hey, I get to keep 70 cents of every dollar. How do I know? Because the tax code tells us that. So I'm going to talk about three different types of income. There's active income, which is ordinary income, like you wouldn't sweat your brow. Trading your time for money is going to be active income. There's something called portfolio income, but I'm, I'm really just going to narrow on one type. It's, it's, we're going to look at like capital gains. We're going to call it the stock market. And then there's real estate rents. So that's passive income. So there's, there's active portfolio 
and passive. But I'm just, I'm, I'm not even going to dive into those. I just want you to think working, stocks, and real estate. Because if you want to get out of here, you, you're you going to work, but you're going to shift that money over into these other two. You got to have the, the stock and you got to have the real estate. My opinion. Some people are going to say, Bitcoin. Bitcoin's not an asset. Gold. Gold's not an asset. doesn't pay you on a monthly basis. Well, stocks don't. If, if you buy the right ones, dividends and you sell covered calls, you could do those weekly. You could have money coming in all the time. Well, but, but real estate, you know, is so expensive. Get cash flow real estate. Understand what a cap rate is and get positive cash flow properties. They're all over the place, right? They're always going to try to find a reason why you shouldn't do what's in your best interest. They're going to try to talk you out of it. Case in point, by the way, we went through this, this COVID crisis, right? Do you remember, just Google these guys getting on the on the TV and saying the stock market was going to crash. Oh, Hilton's going to go to zero. Meanwhile, they're short in Hilton. There, that precise situation occurred where a, a, a hedge fund manager was. Oh, I, I had a dream, and it was it was chaos, and the markets went to zero. He shorted the market, so he's getting everybody to freak out and sell. And meanwhile, what are they doing? They're profiting off of your selling. There was a great one on Twitter not that long ago. I won't, I won't age this, but I'll just say it. Somebody was like, sell everything. Meanwhile, they were buying. Why? Because you start dumping everything. Now it's a buyer's market. They're just tricking you. So we have three types of income. And let me just talk from a tax standpoint. If you have earned income, they tax you at your ordinary tax rate. Your federal rates go from zero to 37%. In addition, they hit you with old age, disability and survivors and Medicare. It's an extra payroll tax. So not only do you pay income tax on the federal level, you could also be paying it on your state, but you also pay this employment tax. And I'm just going to stick to the federal side just to keep it simple. I'm paying up to 37% and I'm paying what's actually 15.3%. There's a little bit of a phase out on it, but I'm just going to say ordinary average Americans get hit with both and they lose about 30 cents of the dollar. That's on average, according to the tax foundation. It's funny because when you look at the employment taxes, it's almost as much collection as federal in, uh, income taxes, but we never talk about it. We always talk about, oh, the federal income tax, half the people don't pay. Those half of people are probably paying all of the like a big chunk of the employment taxes. So quit, quit, quit playing that. That's just called class warfare, getting us to divide against each other so that they can cont continue to control us. Don't fall for it. So active income gets hit with two types of taxes, ordinary and employment taxes. Stocks in real estate, you get hit with neither. Or you, you, you get hit with the ordinary tax in the case of rents. On stocks, it could be some ordinary, some of what's called long-term capital gains, but neither one gets hit with the Social Security tax. Neither one gets FICA. Neither one gets the old age, disability, and survivors of Medicare. Just think about that for a second, right? In one case, I like, again, A, B, C. Let's just do A, B, C. A is me working my butt off and getting 70 cents on the dollar. B is maybe I'm doing stocks. Worst case scenario, I'm paying... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm paying just the ordinary tax. I'm paying a, a, a fraction of, of the amount that I would normally be paying. I'm paying only one of the two. I'm paying just my ordinary bracket. I don't have any, any Social Security taxes. And on three, I'm not paying any Social Security taxes. Worst case scenario, I'm paying ordinary. But I'm going to show you some of the tax benefits. This is where it gets weird. So if you're in a regular tax bracket, like let's say you're just an average American making somewhere around sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year. Your long-term capital gain rate is 15%. A lot of it is at zero. Actually, if, if you're married and you're making 70 grand a year, you're at zero for the long-term capital gains rate. Why is that important? Because that's how dividends are taxed. Qualified dividends from companies like Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, 3M, Walmart, they come out and they are taxed as long-term capital gains. Your tax bracket on that might be zero. 
So remember, I make a dollar over here, I get to keep 70 cents. I make a dollar here, I get to keep the full dollar. That's a full dollar. I'm not being taxed on it. In addition, when you have a stock and it goes up in value, you can borrow against that stock. A lot of people don't realize that there's something called a security back line of credit. I can literally borrow against that stock and go out and buy even more assets. I could buy real estate borrowing against my stock portfolio. But wait a second. You have to pay interest though. Yeah, it's really low actually. Like even now it's a fraction of what your mortgage rate is. And I'm able to generate, like if it's positive cash flow, I'm using that in my calculation. Let's say it's costing me 4% to get money and I have 8% coming in. Great. I made an extra 4%. I made enough to pay it off and keep a, an additional profit. And I still get the growth of my stock and I can still sell covered calls against it. Now, maybe some bells are going off like, what? Yep. How much did you pay on taxes when you borrowed the money? So let's say I bought stocks, it's paying me a dividend. Let's say it's paying me, we start off at 2% a year. Dividends get increased every year on good companies like, like Coca-Cola has been increasing, I think it's 60 years now. And they average around 10% a year. So let's just say that, what would that be every year, seven, seven years, that means it doubles. So let's say that it's, you, you buy it for 50 bucks and it's paying you a buck. Seven years later, it's paying you two bucks every month. And the stock went up to 100. Okay, so I can borrow $50 out, the original 50 bucks, plus I'm getting paid tax-free money. And I go take that 50 bucks and I buy, buy something else that's an income-producing asset. Now you see how it works and you pay zero tax when you borrow money. So remember, A, I'm paying, I'm getting 70 cents on the dollar. B, whoa, I'm getting the full dollar, but I might be getting more than just a dollar. I might be getting a dollar and a half because I can take the other half dollar and invest it in more assets. And then those assets, if I'm doing this right, are also paying me a dividend enough to cover the, the expense uh, if I have to borrow, borrow it, but it's also growing. On average, the S&P's growth is about 10% a year. So let's just say it's 10. I'm, I'm, I'm netting six on just the growth, plus I have dividend, plus I have covered calls. Well, I guess the S&P is 10%, including the dividend. So let's just say it's 10%. We we'll ignore the dividend, but we have the covered call income coming in too. So maybe we get an extra 5 or 6% a year. Whatever the case, I'm I got, those are compounders. In 10, 20 years, that's a substantial difference. Remember, A, I'm getting 70 cents in the dollar and I'm trying to live off it and they're selling me uh, liabilities to, 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 to I'm going crazy. Option B, I'm able to compound it and I'm getting not only do you get the dollar, but I get other benefits as well. Now, this is really going to trip your head. Now, let's go to real estate. Real estate, you get something called depreciation on. So unlike stocks, where if I buy a share of stock for 100 bucks, I can't write it off. Unless you go into like an IRA or something that I'm writing off the money that I'm using to buy the stock. but We won't get that deep. I don't get to write it off. Like I just me individually, I buy a share of stock. I'm not depreciating. I don't get any deduction. I buy real estate. I might get a deduction. Wait a second. I might not have to pay rent or uh, uh, tax on the rents that I generate. Let's say that I buy a house, 10,000, you know, let's say I buy a couple hundred thousand dollar house. I'm just making 10,000 bucks a year. I'm taking the depreciation off that house, the, the value of the little box there, even if I financed it. And I'm going to use that to offset the rent. So I'm not paying tax on the full amount. So not only am I, so let's say I'm making a dollar. There's a good chance I'm getting the full dollar. And if you're savvy and you're really smart investor, you might be buying things for also the tax benefit. So if you are a true real estate professional, like you get in there and you understand what that means. Like you are in real estate. That's where you spend most of your time. More than half of your time is in real estate, more than 750 hours and you're materially participating in your real estate. Then the you could actually create losses from the real estate that offset and go back over to that. Remember that we get 70 cents on the dollar. What if we could get you back up to a dollar? I spend a dollar over here and it allows me to keep my 30 cents over here. That's that's precisely the scenario if, if you know how to do real estate investing. It'll literally go over there and get you back some of that money. That's if you're a real estate professional. That's if somebody, you make your living, you're a real estate agent, you're broker, your construction, you're a management company, or you have your own holdings. 
and you're spending more than 750 hours and it's more time than you spend anything else. And by the way, only one spouse has to qualify for that. It's called a real estate professional. For those of you guys who want to fact check me, it's 26 USC 469 C7. It's the passive activity loss rules. And then there's a reg that's also triggered about material participation on your real estate. But you could see it right there. It's actually plain as day to two requirements. Boom. All of a sudden, that dollar you're spending in real estate may be getting you back 30 cents. Isn't that freaky? How many people told you about this? How many people said, by the way, if you invest in all these different things, there's a good chance that it's actually going to get you back some of your, your dollars that you spent in taxes. Well, what's your proof, Toby? How about our past president, Trump? Remember when they said, hey, you got $90 million back and he paid taxes and he got it all back? How do you think he did that? Precisely what I'm telling you. They actually had a carryback provision there that they've, they've enacted twice in the last 10 years, I think, uh, or 15 years. Obama enacted one where you could carry back your loss. So not only did you get your 30 cents from this year, you go back for the last two years where you paid 30 cents on the dollar for the last two, two, three years, I can go get those too. So then that was also under the CARES Act when, when, when COVID hit, they allowed us to carry back for three years. So there's people going out and buying lots of real estate and they would finance it because money was cheap. And they would get back their 30 cents they paid on, the, on their dollars over here on the active income. Yes, it's true. Just open your mind and learn these things. And it's very, very clear what you should be doing. Work your butt off, put the money into these passive income generators, both in the realm of stock market and the realm of real estate, and you're going to be super successful. They, doing the opposite is how they keep us poor. You may as well be going around the monopoly board. And again, you're excited when you don't land on the income tax. You're excited when you don't land in jail. And you're excited when you go past go and you get that 200 bucks and you're so psyched. Don't live like that. Buy assets. Buy assets so that you're working, that the, the, where they take the 70 cents on the dollar is voluntary. You could choose to do it or not, but you don't want to be in servitude. You don't want to have so much debt that you feel like you're choking. You don't want to be one of those people that's, you know, in their 60s or something and you feel like you're going to have to work forever. We don't want that. I don't want that for you. I don't think you want it for yourself. If you like this type of information, please share it with others and like and subscribe. Always put out videos to try to help you guys. Why? Because we're in this together and there's plenty for everybody. We want you to be successful. And uh, I want you guys, I want everybody to be successful. There's, there's more than enough. But what they do is they trap us into some stinking thinking and they get us into a bad situation. When people are in bad situations, it's hard to be happy. And if you're happy, then every misery loves company. It makes, makes everybody unhappy. So in a weird way, if you want to be happy, find that freedom. Find that freedom by opening up your mind and educating it so that you realize that there's tons of possibilities and tons of options out there for you to take advantage. If that's you, love you, subscribe, and I'll talk to you later.